But then there's been a change. Some people say it was around here that the big change occurred. There was a very famous book published called Silent Spring by a lady called Rachel Carson, an American lady, and she published a book, and it was the first book that pointed out the environmental damage that was being caused by mining. So she went to various mines around the world and saw how much environmental harm was caused by people just digging things out the ground, throwing all the other stuff away, not caring about the environment. And we still now, of course, live with that damage now. I've been to many places in the world, even some very sophisticated countries, like Italy has got tremendous problems from previous mining that was done in a very badly controlled way. Well, now legislation has gone crazy, exponential growth in legislation. And this one here, registration, evaluation, authorization of chemicals, is the most important of them all. It's European legislation. It affects all chemicals that come into Europe and all chemicals that go out of Europe. And it's now being copied. There is now China reach. There is Korea reach. There is very similar legislation now on the books in California and some of the East Coast states in the US. Canada is also enforcing similar legislation. And what reach does is it says that every chemical we use has to be properly tested. We have to check, is it persistent in the environment? Does it bioaccumulate in us or in animals? Is it toxic? PBT. So people talk about, is your chemical PBT? And if your chemical is PBT, then you have a problem because legislation will stop you using it. And this is beginning now to bite. It's beginning to happen now. And many, many chemicals that we have been using for many, many years, people now say, legislation now says, no more. Now, that's another very powerful opportunity for the bioeconomy, for bio refineries, because we need new chemicals. We cannot simply stop using solvents. You know, we need these types of chemicals. They are important for our manufacturing and for the products. But if we cannot continue to use the old ones, we need some new ones. Let's make some new ones which are bio-based, which are genuinely sustainable, which of course are safe to use, which of course do not harm the environment. This is a great opportunity for us to make the world genuinely greener. And in particular, we are very interested in taking waste as a feedstock because you know, we cannot use oil anymore, so what can we use instead of oil? And I would say, well, let's use the stuff that we always say we don't want, because we say we have too much waste. We also say we don't have enough resource. So if you make the waste a resource, it's the circular economy. So we are very interested in taking municipal waste, in taking electronic waste, in taking forestry waste, but also in taking food waste. We have a big interest in food waste. These are the future raw materials for our industries, for the future sources of carbon, metals, and many other things as well, because we've taken all the easy stuff out of the ground already. Now we have to take the more difficult stuff. Now, what are we doing at the moment? Are we actually doing much recycling, for example? And the answer is no. So here's a periodic table which talks about the amount of recycling we are doing. And if it's in red, it means that less than 1% of the metal, the element, is recycled. All again, almost all of those critical elements for the electronics industry, and these ones over here as well, and all of the so-called rare earths, we just don't recycle them. It's incredible. I mean, the rare earths are used in so many applications today. Every wind turbine uses rare earth elements, for example. And they are very heavily concentrated in China and we don't recycle the ones that we use. We are mad, you know, because if we rely on a single source of critical elements for our industry, we have a big problem because we are subject then to basically political blackmail and it's already happening in many places. So we have to improve the record here. You know, there are very few elements, these ones here, that we recycle well. And of course, you recognize the precious elements there. These ones, of course, we all associate with things like jewelry. We do recycle those, and there are some others we recycle pretty well as well, but the majority, we do not. We have to do better. So we have two challenges, really. One is that in the future, when we use something, we have to make sure that we keep it, we recover it, we use it again, we recycle it. We put, fit, fit it with the circular economy. That's the first challenge. Now, that takes time. In the short term, in the medium term, probably in the long term, 
we also have to find a way to use waste. We have to take the stuff that we've been throwing away and get the value back again. We have to do some mine, mining of landfill sites. You know, landfill sites are the future mines. And we have technologies that can do this. This has been known for many years. We know that plants have an amazing capacity for absorbing metals. So here's a very simple picture where you can see the idea. A landfill site is here. And the landfill site, you pump, you have a metal solution which is going through, a solution goes through to leach away some of the metals. It's then concentrated through plants. The plants are then harvested to actually recover the metals. And then you can also get the CO2 heat energy and recycle sorbents back in again as well. So this is a viable technology. We know it works. It's been around for many years. People know about phyto mining. We know it's possible. We are working on this now in a project funded by G8, you know, the big economic grouping. And this is in collaboration with Yale University in the US, the University of British Columbia. And in fact, at the uh, next week, next week, I go to uh, Yale for a meeting there to talk about this project. And what we are doing is we're using special types of plants for concentrating metals, for example, palladium, which concentrate in the roots of certain plants. I don't know why I'm not a plant scientist. And when I ask plant, sci plants, when I ask plant scientists, why do plants take up all these metals in their roots? Because it kills them. It's like suicide. And they don't know either. Strange. Plants are very strange creatures. They can also absorb explosives. Do you know that? So they use plants to actually trap explosives. They go to military testing grounds and they plant certain types of plants. And these plants can absorb TNT. You know, wow, that's scary stuff. Nitroglycerin. So, you know, I wouldn't like to harvest the plants afterwards. That could be a bit dangerous but they take these incredibly dangerous chemicals into their root systems. So we have found, we are very interested because, not because it's uh, a way of remediating uh, contaminated grounds. I mean, that's nice, but it's not the primary objective of what we are doing. We are doing it because we find that in some cases with the right plant, we can actually make the plant take the metal in a nano form. So these are nanoparticles of metals trapped inside the plant. And as you can see from the particle size range, they're quite small and quite a narrow range. And we have taken plants containing these metals and we've then carbonized them to make catalysts directly. And when we do that, this is for a HEC reaction, a carbon-carbon bond forming reaction, catalyzed by palladium in this case. And you can see it's not great. These are different types of plants. And you can see that reuse is not fantastic. We need to work on that and make it better. But the thing is, we can make active catalysts directly from the plant that's been used to capture the metal. And that's something, you know, we are, we are very pleased about and we think we can do a lot more interesting work on that. So that's just saying a little bit about using biomass as a mechanism for trapping metals from contaminated sites and then using that whole system to good effect. But in terms of the fundamental question about future supply of carbon, where will it come from if it's not coming from oil? And I think it's going to come from, well, the picture I showed you before. Forestry waste is a big volume resource. Municipal waste, of course, also big, and also food supply chain waste. And we've been working now for a few years on trying to understand where and what is food supply chain waste. And this complicated looking map gives you an idea about some of the types of food supply chain waste we've identified in many, many places. Now, we have a lot of data. Of course, I come from Europe. We have a lot of official data for Europe. You can see that in the EU, we have about 8 million tons of waste starch, 4 million tons of waste tomatoes, very strangely. All sorts of waste. Bread waste in the UK alone. We throw away almost 1 million tons of bread in the UK every year. That's not good. And it goes on. You can see some citrus waste creeping in there in Spain and in many other countries. And big, big volumes. Africa, the volumes are enormous. Of course, in Brazil, I don't need to tell you this, I hope, these are big, big numbers. And they represent sugarcane bagasse, almost 400 million tons a year of a resource. Incredible, you know? And I look at it and I think chemicals. I see chemicals when I see these things. It's full of interesting chemicals, organic chemicals, but also some interesting inorganic chemicals as well. <coughs> so it's there. Now, the United Nations has done some calculations for us, which is very nice of them. And they said, OK, over 1 billion tons of edible waste and maybe about 3 billion tons of inedible waste like shells and peels and stones and so on. 
and then a lot, of course, of renewable forestry. Add those together, and maybe we have five, six billion tonnes of carbon-rich resource. That is more than enough to make all of the chemicals and solvents and pharmaceuticals, everything I showed you before, not for the liquid fuel. Don't try to use this to make liquid fuel too much because you won't satisfy all of the demand. But we can use it to make all the chemicals we need. We know we can make all of these interesting chemicals from food supply chain residues. When I say food supply chain, by the way, I mean from farm to fork. So at the farm, the gas, straws, things that we don't use very much or have very low value for, orange peel, like today, all the way through. Now, it's difficult when you get to the fork, you in your kitchen, having some food, throwing something away. It's okay, don't send it to me, please. I don't want your kitchen wastes. That's a bit more difficult to manage. I really want to go upstream and work with the guys like we saw today who are making large quantities <coughs> upstream at the processing end, at the growing end, at the processing end. So, you know, I mean, uh, so today we were talking to people who grow oranges. You grow oranges here. Uh, recently, I was talking to a company about 100 kilometers from where I live, uh, a food company, and they squeeze oranges and they squeeze many other things to make juice. They throw away about 50,000 tons a year of peel. Orange peel, 50,000 tons a year. It's nothing compared to the numbers you have in Brazil, but it's significant. That's quite a large amount. And again, I think about all the chemicals that contains. I'll come back to that later. So that's what I mean about food supply chain residues. Look at all these wonderful types of chemicals, all the things we need to make all of the articles I showed you before, from cosmetics through solvents. Aromatics, I've got there in bold. Back to what I said before, big, big challenge. If anybody here can find a way to make renewable aromatics that are cost effective, you can make your fortune. You can now go and buy your island in Hawaii, whatever it is, because it'll be yours, you know? The potential there is fantastic. So that's all known. And that's all gonna move towards the biorefinery. So let's have a look at some examples of biorefineries, things that we are working on. And I keep talking about oranges. So here's a very simple picture of an orange biorefinery. We take some peel. We treat it with microwaves, our preferred technology. We do some simple separations using only ethanol and water. We make some nice material here. We make some oil that contains things like limonene, which is used a lot, for example, for solvents. We make pectin, which is used for food thickening and also for some cosmetics. We make sugars that can be used to make bioethanol and other chemicals. And we, it says 60%, you know, really we'd like to use all of it. We want zero waste by refineries. Now, this is now a project which has now become very serious. We are now working with a big German company to construct a semi-scale, a microwave that will be about as big as this table to really show that this process is serious and can be transferred all the way up to full-scale production, hopefully in the future in Brazil as well. So at the manufacturing end, there's great potential, but I also look for things which make good educational stories as well. And the nice thing about oranges and microwaves is it makes a great educational story. So we did this a couple of years ago with a local school and just got the kids in school to say, okay, take some orange peel, use a domestic microwave oven and then process it and you can make a nice smell, limonene, and you can make pectin and make some jam. It's a very simple thing to do and it's easy for then the children to understand what we are talking about in terms of taking something you don't want and using it to make things you do want. And this has been developed in collaboration with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. If you don't know what that is, look it up or ask Vanya, she knows. Chemically, let's look at some more molecules. So let's have a look in some more complicated structures. So good fun. So lots of orange peel give us all sorts of interesting intermediates. And these can then be used to make, apart from materials, we can make many interesting molecular structures. You know about limonene, of course. You've possibly come across HMF, which is a very interesting intermediate, so-called platform molecule. You can make lots of other molecules from that. Terpineol, you can make inside the microwave by in situ hydrolysis of the limonene. These can then be used in principle to make plastics. I don't think this is a very good thing to do, but it's possible. You can also make simine very easily, which is a very nice solvent. You can make additives, of course, for personal care products. You can make a novel acid we published for the first time, I think, last year or two years ago. You can make a lot of different chemicals by using just one resource. So the concept of the biorefinery is saying you can take a single large volume, 
renewable feedstock, which is not being used for much else at the moment, and you can make a whole range of different and interesting chemicals.